Oh yeah, we can do, we can just start with the foundation beliefs um of the body of Christ and then we can move from there. We can just oh, keep it okay. ongoing. Yeah. Okay. So I can talk yeah. about the foundation. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. in that case, um uh, uh as we know, let's let, let me start a little bit at the beginning. As mm -hmm. we know, there are predominantly two evangels in scripture. Mm -hmm. So Peter's evangel and Paul's evangel. In this day and age, only Paul's evangel is valid. Yeah. Only Paul's evangel. And the, uh, the basis of Paul's evangel, we find, you could say, let me start there, but that's not the fish. We start, we can find in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. But before that passage starts, there is a confirmation, a sevenfold confirmation by Paul. Um, shall I go about that too? Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to go to that now. Or you will share the screen? Yeah, just give me the scriptures. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1 through 4. All right. So the the, the P, the essential piece is in three through four. But uh, let's start at one. Mm -hmm. There Paul says, Now I am making known to you, brethren, the evangel. So this is one. The evangel which I bring to you, which also you accepted, in which also you stand. That's the third confirmation. Mm -hmm. Through which also you are saved. If you are retaining what I said um, in bringing the evangel to you, outside and accept you believe faintly, that's the sixth one. And the seventh one is, for I give over to you among the first what also I accepted. That's the seventh confirmation. And then it starts that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was entombed and that he has been roused the third day according to the scriptures. So that is the core of the evangel. Is that everything? I would say no, that's not everything. Why? Because if we believe this, this consists of, I would say, four bullet points that are essential. Let, let's go through them first before we uh, continue. The first bullet point is Christ died until there. Christ died. The point is that we ought not to believe only that Christ died because in Christianity, as an example, they believe that death is not really death. They believe that death is another way of living. They believe that when your spirit leaves your body as a human spirit, it is still conscious. That's what they believe. And that's a lie of Satan. So a human spirit cannot have consciousness outside the body. So this is very important that, would, that we would believe what that means in the right way. So that's one. The second one is for our sins. So he died for our sins. What does it mean? He was made sin, so there was kind of a swap going on. He was made sin. That uh, You can find that in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, I think, where it says that he became sin or sin offering for us. But sin offering is the same as sin in Scripture, exactly the same. It means waste. So Christ was wasted. That means he was made sin. That's the whole point. He was made waste. So waste, but there is something going on there 
in God's design. Let me let me cover the whole thing. Well, the, the whole essence. The point is that uh, in Colossians 1 verse 16, we can read that in him, in Christ, all has been created. So, uh, uh, in him, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, for in him is all created. That means all is all. So, nothing in creation is outside of Christ created. That's very important to realize. Because the moment we realize this, then we also realize, then it's also logical, that Christ encompasses all of creation. If it's created in him, it means he encompasses all. The same thing. So if he dies, when he died, what logically, what happened? Creation died with him. It's logical. It's just a piece of logic. Yeah. I, when I I have I have like billions of of organisms, microorganisms in my body, as has everyone. When I die, what happens to those organisms? They also die. They cannot uh, keep on living. So that's the point. So creation died together with him, and you can see that also in. A, certain way in 2 Corinthians 5 14 but in any case so the fact that Christ died for our sins is very important because sure. that, yeah that also says that if he died for our sins that means that we have nothing whatsoever to contribute to what he did on the cross nothing whatsoever it's he it's he he died for our sins. We had nothing to bring in. We had nothing to contribute. That means that free will, what people believe they have, is out of the question. Humans have a will. Yes, we have a will. But that will is never free. Not even mm -hmm. a fraction of a second free. It's God who influences all our decisions. He influences that every time for 100%. That's the whole mm -hmm. point. That means that we have a will. Again, we have a will. So we make our choices, yes. But every one of our choices, greater and smaller choices, are totally influenced by God. So that's also important. So first of all, Christ died. Second of all, for our sins. Let me mention another thing. If we say Christ died, that means that there is no trinity. Because if Christ would be God the Father or God as, as such, then he wouldn't be able to die even. Because yeah. God cannot die. Of course not. So Christ is a human. He was a human and he is a human still. He is now the new human according to the new creation. He is the first fruit of the new creation. So very important, and that happens, of course, at his re uh, that happened at his re resurrection. So Christ died for our sins. Three, he was entombed. That's the third bullet point. He was entombed. And do it doesn't say his body was entombed. This is important. It says he was entombed. Scripture is very accurate. Why does it say he? For the simple reason that what are we identified with? Is it our body or, or, or our spirit? It's more our body. Mm -hmm. it's more our body. That's the point. So our, our um, memory is, of course, preserved while we are dead, of course. But it is even if our body is totally gone and equal to soil of the ground, that doesn't matter. Our memory is preserved by God, of course. However, we are most identified with our body. So that's why it says he was entombed and not his body, as if that would be something separate, you know? Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's, the, that's the third one. And the fourth one is, of course, the 
uh, most important one, but also depending on the previous ones, and that is he has been roused the third day according to the scriptures, meaning exactly as the scriptures has prophesied that. So, what does it mean? Let, this means that if, let's say Christians, they think they believe that Christ died and he rose again, he was resurrected, he was roused, he has been roused. They think they, they believe it, but they don't believe it. That's very sad. Because why don't they believe it? Because they think that Christ wasn't really dead. And if he wasn't really dead, how can he be really resurrected? So the value of resurrection is totally diluted by Christianity. That's that's the that's the nasty nefarious lie of Satan. Very and, nefarious. And to add to that, it goes right back to that point in verse two about believing faintly. Exactly. This is not a true belief. It's exactly. a belief based on convenience and a belief exactly. based on false righteousness. Yes. The actual essence of death, if you cannot believe what the scriptures teach about the state of the dead. As you know, many teach that Christ, his spirit, his consciousness was hovering around for three days. Then they truly don't believe that Jesus died and was entombed. And hence, exactly. his resurrection has no meaning either. Exactly. That's the point. So it is, at the end of the day, about his resurrection, of course, his Fifification, those are two things. Resurrection yeah. is just resurrection from the dead that mm -hmm. can also be in your old body. But yeah. fifification means resurrection in a, co co a completely new body, completely new, a resurrected body. And that is a new body, not a, a, a refurbished body, as, the case, as is the case in the evangel of Israel, in Peter's yeah. evangel. In Paul's evangel, we're talking about a totally new creation. It's very important. So this is the core, and this is why it's so important. If you do not really believe those four, those four bullet points, and especially the fourth one, how can you really believe the fourth one, resurrection, if you don't really believe that he died for our sins? If you think that you have to make the right decision to accept Jesus, then it's about your will. Then it's about your decision as a human, which determines your so-called eternal destination. Wow, that's heavy. That is a lie, of course. So, uh, and it's uh, Christians who are the, yeah, I, I would say we use those because they believe faintly, as you said mm -hmm. already. They are the ones who really think they are righteous because they made the right decision and they haven't. Of course not. So, and if you have seen, beliefs, the, believing faintly is the sixth confirmation by Paul. The sixth. Can you believe it? Scripture is very accurate. Very accurate. So, uh, and six is the number of men. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have very to say that for the listeners. So, yeah. It's unbelievable. But anyway, so this is the core. However, let's say you would believe everything in the right way that uh, first three and four are saying. Let's say you would believe everything. But you would still believe that God will uh, punish or burn people in flames without stopping eternally. Then you, you, then you have not understood this message. Why? Because it is not only about Christ died for our sins, was entombed, and has been roused the third day, the third day but the point is, what is the result of that, what he did for us? The result is that ultimately all creation is saved. Ultimately. And that salvation is a process. Salvation is an overarching expression. It's like an umbrella. 
expression, but uh, salvation will be, it's still a process, and it will be totally accomplished, and you already mentioned in Colossians 1.20, where it says, through him, him is Christ, to reconcile all to him, to God, making peace, through the blood of his cross, Christ's cross, through him, whether on the earth or in the heavens. So this is so important to mention because this is about the ultimate reconciliation of all. What does reconciliation mean? That means a change from enmity to fellowship or friendship or family, if you want. And that is a, a step deeper than something that also has been accomplished for us on the cross by Christ. And that is justification. Justification is done by Christ through his blood in his office as Christ. In his office as the anointed one. So he has justified us. However... That process of justification, and it also applies to uh, conciliation, is that, um, let me start with justification. We, the, who is justifica justified right now as we speak? Who is justified? Believers. Exactly. But are we reckoned righteous or are we constituted righteous? We are reckoned righteous. Yeah. Why? Because we have received faith from God. And on the basis of that faith, the faith of Jesus Christ, which is the basis of all justification. And uh, you can find that in Romans 3, verse 21, 22. The faith of Jesus Christ. And that, so the faith that he has, or that he be had back then, or still has, in his father, in his father's ability to resurrect him from the dead, that faith is the basis on which our uh, justification is built. Let's read verse 21, 22. Now it says, Yet now, apart from law, again, apart from the law, or any works thereof, a righteousness of God is manifest, manifest, Visible now, brought brought into visibility, being attested by the law and the prophets, yet a righteousness of God through Jesus Christ's faith for all. So it is for all, no one accepted, and it is already on all who are believing, for there is no distinction. Very important, that part. So, again, to, uh, to uh, recap, justification, that means you are declared not guilty. That means that whatever you have done in the past, whatever you are doing right now in the present, and whatever you will do in, in terms of sinning in the future, it's already regarded as not guilty. You are not guilty whatever you do or not do. You are not guilty. Very important. Because that frees you from everything that you need to do to walk worthily. You need, you need to do nothing. It's about the faith that you have received from God. And that faith makes you different from the ones who did not have received faith yet. That's, that's, the, that's the only difference that distincts us from the unbelievers. We have received it because God determined it like that. He chose a, a certain amount of people before the disruption of the world. It's a, it's a certain term. Let's not go into everything. Before the disruption, he chose us already. And while we are living our lives on this earth, he chose a time to call us. So he calls us. How does he do that? By giving us faith. He makes, he sends someone our path or makes us read something. We understand it suddenly. The coin falls. 
and we receive faith and all of a sudden we see it we see it we understand it the coin has fallen that's the whole point that is what god does in his own timing with everyone he has chosen in the past so we are still in that era of the evangel of paul that god is calling people out of the whole population to be in a certain group of believers called the body of christ and the there is another group of believers in the bible even uh, encompassing a greater uh, a greater amount a way greater amount of scripture and that is the believers out of israel and they are called the bride of the lambkin so those are two totally distinct groups of believers the body of christ is a male group is male and the bride of the lambkin is a female group and uh, that is now again as we speak not applicable that evangel that leads to people coming into the bride of the lambkin is today not applicable only paul's evangel is applicable and valid today until the snatching away until the body of christ will be snatched away from this earth and then the, the next very second israel will become god's people again and every person who comes to the faith then at that time will be a member of the uh, the lambkin the, the bride sorry the bride of the lambkin there is some things to say about that additionally but then we go into some rabbit hole, rabbit holes yes so, uh, clear, right yes uh, any questions you guys want to ask on that so far, I have a question. Right. Go ahead, Monique. Yeah, I had this question from our last meeting, John. I didn't get to ask, and mm -hmm. I wanted to touch on the exact thing again. Hi, Monique. So, hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, Christians go with the amalgamization of, like, the mix of the Israel and Paul's evangel. So, yes. my question is. Would Christians be considered as a part of the body of Christ? Because from what I'm understanding, being a part of the body of Christ or being considered a believer is receiving that faith from God and getting that revelation of Paul's evangel. So where would Christians fall? Because you have the Israelites kind of believers and then you have those who fall under Paul's evangel. So where would Christians fall? In between. <laughs> <laughs> that means that christians are unbelievers ah. according to the evangel of paul which is only valid in this era right so while so the, the evangel of paul is is valid and mm -hmm. this means that christians they don't believe the evangel of paul they are preaching mm -hmm. a mixed evangel because they are not even aware that they are that there are two predominant evangels in scripture mm -hmm. so they are mixing everything and let me ask you this simple question mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the kitchen cabinet in your house and you take ingredients for a uh, for a nice uh, salty dish mm -hmm. and you mix it with ingredients for a nice cake or mm -hmm. a nice pie, a sweet pie. What do you get if you mix those ingredients and you eat it? You get a disaster. <laughs> yes. And that is exactly what Christianity is preaching and what they are consuming in the mm -hmm. in the benches and the uh, the pews of the church, the churches. Yeah. So what does Paul said about mm -hmm. that mixing? He says in Galatians one verse eight and nine. He says that people who are believing such a mixed evangel, they are anathema. Anathema means they are cursed. Mm. Cursed. So, believe it or not, we're yeah. talking about more than 2 billion people who are cursed mm -hmm. right now. 
and they don't even know it. And they don't want to know it because when I talk to Christians about the two evangels, they reject it. They say, no, there is only one evangel. Mm -hmm. Okay, I rest my case. So they fall in between the cracks. And uh, ask Korah in the, in the desert, in the wilderness, in the time of Moses, Korah and his crew who rebelled against Moses. Well, mm -hmm. the earth opened up. That was a crack. And they fell in between the cracks. Wow. <laughs> so Korah will, t will be able to tell you how it feels to fall between the cracks. Yeah, that's actually the scripture I was looking for, but I actually typed another evangel where Paul says, even if it's a messenger out of heaven, exactly. that teaches something that is apart from this evangel which we bring to you, let him be an ataman. And of course, the basis of Galatians was to a group of people who received Paul's evangel, but then they were in the spirit of listening to the Jews who were coming again to them exactly. with the law. And Paul was yeah. saying, you already heard this. Why are you allowing them to take away this peace that I have exactly. given to you through, through the message? So yes. very important point there that yeah. it's only one or the other. Yeah. And any mixing of the two, it, it, it's, it's, not a, it's, not, it's, it's, it's actually called anathema, as you said. It's another exactly. evangel. Gushed. And just to show you quickly how accurate scripture is in Galatians uh, 1, 8, 9, it's, it talks about, uh, let's read verse 7. Um, no, let's read verse 6. I am marveling that thus swiftly you are transferred, transferred from that which calls you in the grace of Christ, that's Paul's evangel, to a different evangel, that's not Israel's evangel. Mm -hmm. Listen correctly. Mm -hmm. Why is it not Israel's evangel, this different evangel? Because in verse 7 it says, which is not another. And that other, that Greek word for other is alos. And alos or alo or alon, uh, these are all, all conjugations. That word means a, a other from the same type from the same category, but different, that Greek word that is translated different evangel in verse 6, that is heteros, not alos, but heteros. That means another one from a totally different kind, a different category. And that's the false category. You see the point. So this is very important to understand that the other that the different evangel is a false evangel that is neither Paul's evangel nor Israel's or Peter's evangel. Very important. I see a message that the call ends in 15 minutes. Yeah, it's fine. You can continue. I'll just address right. that situation right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Marie, do you have any questions so far? Mm, not as yet, not as yet. Just listening okay. and observing. Yeah, yeah it, is, it is. It is shocking. I was just <laughs> talking ye yesterday and today with a with a, a Suriname uh, guy, and uh, and he is in church. He's a Christian, but he's. I see how his his eyes are starting to be opened, and mm -hmm. he contacts me, and he cannot even fathom. He says, "My goodness." So he, he now believes that there is no trinity, but he says, but the people around me, they are fighting me. They are, they are, they are blaspheming, etc., etc. And I say, yeah, this is what I deal with for more than 30 years. So, I mean, this is the, 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 the line, the red thread in Christianity. They are blaspheming God without even realizing it. And that's what Satan does. That's what the adversary does. So uh, it's unbelievable, but it is truly shocking the, 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 the great amount of people in the world, more than 2 billion people in the world, who are totally in, in a falsehood. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but let me mention it. Um, in Daniel 7, 
Daniel 7, um, Daniel sees a vision of four monstrous animals coming out of the sea. The sea in scripture is always a type of the peoples, the nations of the world. But those four monstrous animals are then described by Daniel from east to west. And east is always the first because the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west. And that uh, those four animals are described in Daniel 7. And if you study them, you will see that they have to be the four Gentile world religions described from east to west. So I will mention them. They are Buddhism, the most eastern one, Hinduism, and then Islam, and Christianity, the western one, the most western one. So, and also Christianity, the most western one, is described as a monstrous animal that is not even to be described as an animal we know and it has iron teeth and it stems on everything it encounters so to, so to speak that is christianity for you and people do not realize that but it is it is that character what christianity has mm -hmm. so it's very important to see that christianity is just one of the four Gentile world religions, one uh, uh, to be to be compared by Scripture with a monstrous animal. That is Christianity. Yeah. So keep that in mind as well. Beautiful, beautiful. So we looked on the the foundations being true belief, not feigned belief in exactly. the death, entombment, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And along with that text, we, we understand that if Jesus can die, then there is no Trinity. And exactly. if Jesus died for our sins, according to the scripture, that aligns perfectly with the declaration of John, where it says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the Of the world. world. Of exactly. the world. Exactly. And so, by the way, by the way, little remark. The word that John uses for sin, that word, is singular. Mm. singular. So the question is, what is the singular sin that Christ took away? The sin of Adam. Uh, what do you say? You could say that, you could say that, but what is that sin? Because that's, that word sin there in John mm -hmm. one twenty nine is singular so that word uh, that sin i will i will mention the scripture where you can find what sin that is because mm -hmm. that is the root sin that is mm -hmm. the root sin of all the sins and that you can find if i'm not mistaken in john 16 verse 8 or 8 verse 16 i'm i'm let, right, let's just, let's, take, let's take a look take a look so John 8, 8 for 16, let's see. Uh, uh, no, it's not this one. Because this one is that and 16. Uh, no, then it's 16 for 8. All right, let's see. Oh, yes, that's the one. That's the one. Believe. Ah. Faith. Believe. That is the unbelief is the root of all sins. That's the whole point. Yep. And unbelief killed Jesus on the cross. Yeah. It was the unbelief of the Pharisees. That's yeah, and I mean, that, that, that goes right back to Corinthians, where Paul says that if the chief, meaning both celestial and human chiefs, knew that Jesus was the Messiah, they would not have crucified him. Exactly. And that's that's a first very Corinthians. interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's a very interesting point that most yeah. in Christianity don't understand they, because they believe no. that man exercised some form of free will exactly. to kill Jesus when Jesus yeah. himself prayed, thanking his father, saying, Father, 
I thank you that you have hidden these things exactly from their comprehension yep. so that the scriptures may be fulfilled. So exactly. unbelief, as God decides, as Romans yep. 9, that he hardens who he wills and he has exactly. mercy on who he wills, yep. is yes. something that is not of our choosing. No. We only get faith by God's choosing. And that is, is that, yeah. yeah. And it goes right back to even second Thessalonians 2.16, where after Paul looked on, after he, 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 he spoke about this and what the man of lawlessness would do, I think it's 2.16 or 2.13, where it says, because we have this faith, we have to be thanking God always. Always. Because yeah. it's a preference of God from That's the right. beginning to have salvation and faith in the truth. Amen. Very yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, um, it, it is true that God's, it has always been God's show. It's God's show. Um, excuse me. The scripture, um, 16 verse 8, it says, I don't see where it talk about unbelief. Uh, let's jump back there. John, John 16 verse, verse 8. Yeah, so, so it's actually 6, 8 and 9. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. It's a it's a very well known text, also yeah. uh, uh, used in churches. And mm -hmm. coming that will be exposing the world concerning sin, concerning righteousness, and concerning judging. And then he expounds on those three, and he starts with concerning sin. Indeed, seeing that they are not believing in me. You see, sin, uh, singular. Sin, mm -hmm. singular. Yeah. yeah. This is the root of yes, all yes. sin. You see the point? Yes, yes, I see. No. Great, great, great. So uh, please go to, just uh, to show uh, uh, all the watchers also, to 1 Corinthians 15, 28, because that's, of course, the well-known first, but it's good to show. Mm -hmm. This is the end goal. This is the this is the purpose of God's grand plan when it says, Now, whenever all may be subjected to him, and who is him? Him is uh, there in this context, the Son of God. Yeah, the Son Christ. of God. But who subjects all to the Son of God? That is God through his power. Very important. So now, Whenever all may be subjected to him, then the Son himself, listen to this, also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, that God may be all, all in everyone, in all, in everyone. So you see there the confirmation that it is God, him, who subjects all to him. Him is the Father who subjects all to Him that is the Son. You see the point? And that's why it also says the Son Himself not, shall not subject Himself. No, He shall be subjected to the Father by the Father. Mm -hmm. So it is God's show. That's the point I wanted to make. It is God's show all along. Everything um, is His direction. Yeah, and this aligns, I think it's Philippians, where it says God glorifies the Son and gives him a name that is above every name. Yeah. Whether thrones, lordships, authorities. And he says that at the name of Jesus, every yeah, knee, exactly. celestial, terrestrial, and subterranean, and every tongue will be acclaiming that Jesus is Lord, Lord again to the glory, to the glory. Yes. of God exactly. the Father. Do you remember exactly. where that scripture is? It's first oh, yeah, Philippians 2, verse 10 yeah. and 11. Yes, beautiful. Wherefore also God highly exalts him. It's not Christ it's exalted God is doing, himself. You see that God is the active one. God yeah. is the active party here. You see the point? He does yeah. everything through his spirit. He does everything. He, he, Holy Spirit is God. Holy, mm -hmm. very important for the listeners. Holy Spirit is not the third person of the Trinity. No, Holy Spirit is the Father. 
and I have proof for you. And the proof is this. I always ask, who is Jesus' father? Because he was born out of Miriam. That's her real name, her Jewish name, mm -hmm. not Mary. But anyway, mm -hmm. he was born out of Miriam. But who is his father? And then everyone would say, God, God the Father is the father of Jesus. And I would say, yes, amen, I agree. But wait a minute, who uh, uh, conceived, uh, is that the word? Who conceived no. uh, Miriam? Who conceived that seed in Mary, in Miriam? And you can read that in Luke one thirty-five, that it says, Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit will come over you, will overshadow you. Wait a minute. But if it's Holy Spirit that con conceived uh, Mary or Miriam, who is the biological father of Jesus? Is it Holy Spirit? No, it is God the Father. Holy Spirit is God the Father because the Father is Spirit. It's spirit. He yeah. is Spirit. That's the whole point. But the moment that Scripture talks about Holy Spirit, then it uh, it almost always talks about the Father in His operational power. That's the point. The Father, as He operates everything according to His plan. That is the point. Everything in the universe is operated by God through His Spirit. That's the point. That's all. It's not, it's not difficult. Mm -hmm. Only one God. No tr Trinity. One God. The Father. That's it. And of course, there is the Son of God, and who also has the role of mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That is First Timothy two verse five. So it's very important to uh, to realize these truths, to believe them. Because, but yeah, if you cannot see them, it's God who doesn't give you faith. That's the point. That's the whole point. And that keeps us humble. Because we realize until every bone in our body that it is God who gave us this faith. So that humiliates, that makes, that keeps us humble. Because we know and we realize that we are nothing but clay. Clay in the hands of the potter. And there, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, Romans 9. Yeah, exactly. Um, Verse 21. Like verse 21, yes. Has not the potter the right over the clay uh, out of the same lump, the same kneading to make one vessel indeed for honor, yet one another for dishonor. The same piece of clay. It's God's show. He does it all along. It's his show. And, and you know, Ephesians 1, 11 goes right yeah. up to that where it says, we were designated beforehand according to the purpose of God, who is operating all oh. in accord with the counsel of His will. Yep. So the only thing, if we pray to God, <laughs> the only thing we can pray in a valid way is according to the counsel of His will, because that's how we operate. So he mm -hmm. doesn't listen to your prayer. No, he operates according to the counsel of his will. And that is the best for every individual. That is the best that leads to the best possible outcome for every individual. The counsel yeah. of God's will. Oh, that, that, that is very... And it, it's, so it's important. Point. Let me just mention it very briefly. It's important to see the difference between God's will and God's counsel. Because God's will is what he states in terms of the ending purpose. This is what I want accomplished. This is what I want. But then his counsel comes into action. But his counsel doesn't draw a straight line until his ending purpose no 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 it uh, it goes along a lot of sometimes even dark ways and dark paths in order to reach the maximum and also optimal purpose for every individual 
That is his counsel. So his counsel is like his strategy, his method, the way he is operating until that ending purpose. And his will is his ending purpose. You see the point? Very important. So his will is his ending goal, so to speak. And that's also relatively. And his counsel is the way he uses the path he walks until that ending purpose. Uh, a very important, uh, 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 well, a very well known. Uh, let me read this one first, Romans 8 20, very important also. It says very clearly, for to vanity, that means uselessness, was, this cre was the creation subjected, not voluntarily. How? Oh, there you have it. It was subjected by God, not voluntarily. The creation was subjected because let's see of him, him of him yeah that, that was great so i cannot see it <laughs> yeah yes. now i can see it yeah because of him who subjects it and who is him god in expectation and what is the end goal that the creation itself also shall be freed from the slavery of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. That's I'll it. stop you right there, Peter. Yeah. Just for a pause. Miss Andrea raised her hand. Yes, you had a question. Yes. Yes. Um, just looking back over the years, as Christians growing up in the church, we would think that oh, it's our poor saved grandma from not dying. But looking back, really. And knowing what I'm knowing, it had to be God opening your eyes to give you the understanding. Exactly. Because seriously, when you go to church and you hear, God, you have to do it. God, do it. God, tell. And oh, you know, oh, you were brought up. And looking back, you know that it's only God could have opened your eyes and yep. give you the understanding. Say, so, hey, he operates in the council of his will. Exactly. But looking back, you can't say that. You can't say that to, to, to Christians. No, you cannot. Nope. Because nope. them just think that we have a choice in the matter. And, and yep. we used to think that way. I used to think that way. Yeah, but looking too, back, yeah. we are sinners. Oh, am I going to have... Oh, am I going... How can I yeah. pray that grandma be saved, um, be healed? Means that God? No, really. So, so just, just thinking about the old um scripture, Ephesians 1, 7 that God operated in the counts of his will and yeah. grandma would have been saved from the big eel from the beginning of time. Yep. Yes. So he's the one who really would have to walk our eyes and give us the understanding of all these things. Nobody yeah. else but him. No, exactly. He runs the show from beginning to end. Everything from, from large to the smallest atomic particle. He runs the show. He directs everything. Yeah, this is a, a great one also, yeah, where it, it clearly says that it is an experience of evil that Elohim, that's God, has given to the sons of humanity to humble them by it. That says a lot right there. Where is this scripture? Where is because it? Yes, he is one thirteen. Ecclesiastes 1.13. Yes. And even in the circumcision scriptures, you find a lot yeah. Oh, yeah. of these oh, declarations yeah. as well. Another yeah. uh, good one is Proper Isaiah, 15. Oh, Sorry, yeah. Isaiah 45, uh, 7. Uh, Proverbs and even 16, Isaiah, four. let's jump there. Proverbs 16, verse 4. Yahweh has made everything for his own outcome. Yeah, even the wicked for the day of evil whoops mm. and then christians are to think here this is the word of god we're talking about and then isaiah uh, 45 you, isaiah, you want to go isaiah 45 first okay, then we can look on 46 as well yeah and, and 54 54 yeah. also yeah 45 7 where yahweh clearly says former of light and creator of darkness, maker of good, and creator of evil. 
I, Yahweh, make all these things. He takes responsibility for all his actions. So hmm. he creates evil. And by the way, you see the distinction. The same between... question also there as well. Yeah. What Paul made. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. What are you making? I think uh, uh, Paul is citing Isaiah here. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. So you see the difference in verse 7 between making and creating. Interesting, huh? Good was there all along already. So making is only like forming out something that is already there. But creating is creating out of something that was not there. So creating from nothing, from scratch. That's what God did with evil. Because it is necessary during the course of his plan with creation that is why creation uh, evil is necessary because it is something that will lead to the highest um, uh, experience of glory that's why evil is necessary yeah this one also yes telling from the beginning the hereafter and from aforetime what has not yet been done saying all my counsel it shall be confirmed and all my desire shall i do and you see that you cannot thwart god's counsel it's impossible you can thwart his will but that is because he leads you to thwart his own will when he says to moses say to pharaoh let my people go yahweh says let my people go that's his will that's his will but then, what does Yahweh do? The same Yahweh, he hardens the heart of Pharaoh to not let his people go. That is his counsel. That is acting according to his counsel. That uses other ways in order to ultimately reach his purpose. That's the point. That's how God operates. So no one can thwart his counsel. You can think you can toward his will, but it's he who makes you toward his will. That's the whole point. He is the one who will make the Antichrist in the end times blaspheme him. him. Blaspheme him. God will make, I will repeat myself, God is the one who will make the Antichrist in the end, end times uh, blaspheme him. God. Think about it. God is doing it. It's God's counsel. It's not God's will. It's God's counsel. It's the way, his method. He acts in, in order to ultimately reach his goal. And therefore, at, at exactly, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11, and therefore God will be sending them an operation of deception for them to believe the falsehood. And who is them? No, let's go continue. That all may be judged who do not believe the truth, but delight in injustice. That is the group he's talking about who will be deceived in the end times. And it's interesting here that the unveiling of the lawless one is who Jesus dispatches with the yep. spirit of his mouth. Yep. It is exactly. Jesus that dispatches the on the yeah. lawless one. Yeah. Only and he's also the one who discards him. Exactly. Yes. Because he would have served this purpose during that three and a half years plus. Exactly. Years. Yes. And the whole thing, Jesus discarding the beast, the man of lawlessness, that whole thing is God's show again. Because God determines how much power an individual has at any time so if 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 there is war in heaven like uh, um, revelation 12 verse 7 war in heaven between michael and his angels and the devil or the satan and his angels but then there is no place for them anymore because they th throw him out of heaven with his angels and he finds himself back on earth or he finds himself on earth and he's very angry that's mm -hmm. very that's very funny i have to say mm -hmm. because uh let's see um let's see battle occurred in heaven michael and his messengers 
and the dragon and his messengers exactly and they are the the, the dragon and his messenger messengers are not strong enough for him for michael and neither was their place still found in heaven the dragon was cast out the ancient serpent court called adversary and satan who is deceiving the whole inhabited earth it was cast into the earth and his messengers were cast with it and then there's a voice of joy in heaven be glad because satan the accuser of our brethren was cast out and uh, what i like if you go further down uh yeah verse 13 i love verse 13 and when the dragon perceived <laughs> that it was <laughs> cast into the earth so it's like he found himself on earth like dizzy you know he was like where am i on earth wow he's very angry and then he persecutes the woman who brought forth the male i love that passage <laughs> because he finds himself like dizzy and i'm first like oh where am i i am on, on earth wow angry cast out of heaven and going after that woman fantastic i love it so yes miss tatlin but it's yeah oh sorry to cut you i just realized miss um tatlin raised her hand to ask, yeah. the, ask the question all right so while i understand um oh, good afternoon everybody i afternoon. i'm a little bit late so i missed some of the stuff i fell asleep but mm -hmm. um while i understand um, um, that God operates in his own purpose. Um, when I'm looking at the situation, there are people who find themselves doing stuff and they don't understand why they are doing it. And uh, you, you guys, which I've learned when we were doing the stu study with Joel, that, um, God allowed these things to happen. What happened to those people who don't understand these things and they find themselves doing these things, doing negative stuff or wrong things, and um, they don't know, they don't have the inclination to stop or, or, or to stop doing evil? That's my first question. The next okay. thing is, what about person? For let me let me share my ex experience. I have a sister who. When she was born, she was perfectly fine until she reached early adult and she became mentally ill. And she operates out of the norm. What happened to she? She doesn't understand what is happening to her because up to the early part of this year, she was convinced she was fine. She, she's now saying that she's sick and she's going to be okay. But what happened to those persons? How are they treated? Or how should their family members relate to situations like this? My other question is, when, when an individual finds themselves into constant hardship, and no matter what they do, it continues. What do they do? How do they handle it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's start with your first question. Um, God. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that there is not no no such thing as a free will for any creation. Free will doesn't exist. That means that our will can never at any time be free from God's direction. So uh, just a little elaboration on that. Um, God decides our DNA our bloodline that influences our decision greatly second he decides in which family we are born not only the bloodline but also the family that we grow up in that's that influences our decision making greatly he decides also and not to elaborate on that but just to mention it he decides uh, our uh, uh, timing of birth that means that he decides the mix between the year of birth and the month of birth. That mm -hmm. means our constellation. Yes. He decides that. That also influences our character and decision making. And apart from that, he also influence, uh, he influences all circumstances within the universe. 
whatsoever he influences them god means placer that means he places every circumstance that influence our decision making he places that in our lives on the path of our life so god is never i heard you mention the word allow allowing god never allows anything he directs actively everything operates he, he operates. operates everything according to the counsel of his will so this is very important very important to realize so why and let me put it more in a general way why is there so much evil in the world so also regarding the people who cannot stop doing evil or your sister it is well to me uh, already clear it the reason is that god has created evil in order for the creation to experience good because it is about the principle of contrast in his plan that is the 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 key essential part of god's plan the principle of contrast that means that experience of good the knowledge of good is not separately available without the knowledge of evil it is impossible that's why god named that tree in the garden of eden from which they were not supposed to eat he named that tree the tree of knowledge of both of knowledge of good and evil both because the one cannot be the, the known without the other let me put it like that so knowledge of good can only be known thanks to knowledge of evil does it mean that evil will always be in god's plan no because evil will have it, it has a purpose now but when it has fulfilled its purpose at the end of god's plan at the consummation then evil will be removed and then you will see the beauty of the building that god has been building all along without those uh, ugly i don't know the english word of that those things that you build uh, when you build a, a, a house that you have those things that uh, painters and carpenters yeah. stand upon i don't know how yeah. it's in english anyway anyway so that is the evil that will be removed but what will remain the knowledge of evil will remain because that's the reason why you will enjoy such a glory at the end of god's plan and that also applies for the person who cannot stop doing evil now and that also applies for your sister of course it applies for everyone so god's plan knows stages in which everything will be fulfilled I hope it's clear. Yes, you know, um, sometimes because the things are recurring, it baffles me a little bit, but yes, I got it. Okay, so the greater the evil you are confronted with or doing even, if you realize who God is, you will thank him for it because then you will see, wow, so he does this for me so that i have a greater experience of glory at the end because that is the only purpose that god has for everyone that's the point that's why that's how he uses evil that's why evil also ha hasn't reached its its pinnacle yet on earth it will increase the coming uh, years it will increase because it has to reach a maximum level so that all the glory that god has in store for creation will be poured out eventually beautiful i saw miss andrea you had your, yes. your hand up question yeah yes um um growing up in a church or you know you would hear that lesbianism homosexualism is abomination so i would like to ask a question now can a believer be indulged in those things? Can yes. God choose you to be a believer and you are in that? Oh, yes. You can do a lot of abominations as a believer. However, yes. 
there are consequences. The consequences is the, are not that you will have that you won't have life Ionian. So again, let me be very clear. If this is about a believer who genuinely believes Paul's evangel, as we have discussed it in the beginning. The ones who genuinely believe are believers because they are given faith by God himself. So God has chosen them already before, far before their birth, before the disruption of the world. So they are a believer according to God's calling. And now they are doing abominations. So they are not walking in the, in the right way. They are not giving an example to their um, uh, surroundings. In that case, that believer will not rule and reign with Christ. They will not rule and reign with Christ. They will be snatched away. They will be in the heavens. Yes, they will be part. They are part of the body of Christ and they will be part of the body of Christ when everyone gets their position at the days of Christ. But the works, because the works in that sense, are also what God prepared for them to walk in. Ephesians 2 verse 10. So uh, God is the one who prepares every work that we are walking in. Let's read it. For his achievement, achievement, his achievement are we, being created in Christ Jesus for good works, not our works, but what he has prepared, because it says, which God makes ready beforehand that we should be walking in them. Who makes them ready? The works. God. So also the not good works that we are doing are also according to God's counsel. Because at the days of Christ, when everyone in the body of Christ is standing there, we will get rewards. It's The days is not a judgment seat as King James puts it, but it's about a, a raised platform that you will stand upon and just get rewards. But if you have done works that are not worth rewards in that sense, they will be burned up in fire. The works are burned up in fire. Then you don't have any reward let, as an example. But in that case, you will probably, I'm just now uh, this is a little bit of speculation, so this is not scripture as such. But the fact that you will not rule and reign with Christ together in a section of the heavens, as an example, you will probably assist someone, another member of the body of Christ, who will be reigning and ruling with Christ in a certain section. It says in Second uh, Corinthians 5, yes, verse 10, for all of us must be manifested in front of the days that raise platform of Christ, that each should be requited for that, that which he puts into practice through the body, whether good or bad. There you have it. So a believer is, um, uh, has life Ionian because of what they believe and God determines that, not what they do. But, okay, okay. The, but, the, but their works will have consequences in terms of the position they will have in the celestials. That is the difference. But look here. If God operates in the council of his will, and we don't have a choice in the matter, wouldn't it be that this God put it that kind of behavior, yes. uh, what you would call it now? That kind of lifestyle in him. So, you know, yep, you know, yep. God, God is doing everything. He directs the whole thing, good and evil. He directs everything. So, also in the life of a believer, he directs everything, of course. So, absolutely speaking, listen now. Now we're coming to the difference between the relative and absolute viewpoint. Absolutely speaking, God is directing everything. However, relatively, let's say it is a fellow believer of mine, and I know that he or she is doing these things. I will talk to them. I will talk to them to, to tell them, to, to, to uh, admonish them, hey, what are you doing? 
live a, live a holy life, a life that is worthy of your calling. That's the point. And you can see that in, oh, you have another verse. Uh, which in answering the question of oh, yeah. why God does that, he carries with much patience the vessels of indignation so that, exactly. again, the contrast, his riches of glory can be made known on the exactly. vessels of mercy, which he prepares before. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And there's also, uh, I was thinking on another verse also. Um, well, uh, uh, let's see, I don't, I don't remember it. Uh, but the thing is, if I talk to a fellow believer and I admonish them not to do these things, and let, let's say it, it is pro possible that the, he listens or they listen and they don't do it anymore or they diminish their actions or, on that area or they keep on doing it, that's also possible. There is an example of a man who was having sex with his stepmom. That's a believer. That's 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. It's a believer. So he, Paul, but Paul uh, said something to them to do in his capacity and authority as apostle. So we cannot do that. Let's be very clear. So 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5, uh, what does Paul says there? To give, uh, let's see, uh, pop up, yes. To give up such a one, let's, uh, yeah, let's let's uh, look at verse one first. Absolutely, it is heard that there is prostitution among you, and such prostitution which is not even named among the nations, so that some uh, someone has his father's wife meaning have sex with his step his stepmom that's the point so and then what are, are they are uh, what uh, had they what must they do according to paul verse 5 to give up such a one to satan for the extermination of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the lord jesus that is a specific thing but it has to do with um with um, what is the word? Um, expelling him out of the midst of that local ecclesia. But in that time, there were still local ecclesias. Now there are not. So let's also be clear about that. That was still an immature uh, body of Christ in its immature phase. So at that time, there were, there were human leaders in those local ecclesias, elders and deacons. Now it doesn't exist because in the in the maturity phase which which we are in which we are now as the body of Christ, there are no human ministries anymore like that. It is not there because God's word fulfills all those roles because God's word is now completed by the Apostle Paul just before he died. So it's very important to see that. So it's about extermination. Um, expelling from their midst but later you go to a second corinthians but i don't know what uh, brother peter brother peter yes, one minute. yes, Take yes. one pin so if i talk to the person or pray for the person it will be up to god to take that behavior from him yeah seeing that god operates in the council of his will yes okay okay the question is Will God do it or not? Is it is it part of God's plan or not? That's the question. Oh, okay. Look at Paul. Remember Paul in in Second Corinthians twelve, I think, where he where he was taken uh, to the third heaven, and he saw things that were ineffable, and he saw great things. But but God, from that moment on, God sent him a, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. Mm -hmm. And for three times he asked God to remove it. And he said to him, and I, I think it was Christ. I'm not sure, but I think it was Christ. He said, my grace is enough for you. My grace is enough for you. That was the answer. He never took it away from Paul anymore until he died. So this is possible if it's according to his plan. So uh, let's see. Uh, Yes, uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 24. 
I think um, go to Second Corinthians. Did I say Timothy? No, I think uh, let's let's go to Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians twelve. Okay. Twelve, and there you see uh, that he talks about his experience eh, yeah. to be transported to the third heaven. And uh, in order to prevent Paul from boasting about it, he gave God gave him that messenger of Satan. Uh, so lest he may be lifted up, you see there in verse 7, lest I may be lifted up, says Paul. So uh, a messenger of Satan that he may be buffeting me, lest I may be lifted up. And he entreat the Lord thrice that it should withdraw from him that uh, that buffeting that messenger and he protested to paul saying sufficient for you is my grace for right. power in infirmity is being perfected Sorry. so I, I just want to ask something um yeah. so so there are people that i have known who they do evil things but they don't want to do it that part I don't understand because as we keep emphasizing, God operates in his own um, way. And they, some people even say, but if God loves me, then he wouldn't let, this, let me do this or let me continue to do this. How do you, how do you explain that? Because that has, it, go ahead. That, that has to do with the, the image you have from Paul, uh, from, uh, sorry, from God. So what image do you have of God? Because people associate God only with goodness. So God never would do this to me. Never. But is that true? Man, I can show you scripture verses from here to Tokyo that where God does evil things to people. <laughs> yes, he does. And he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it. Look at strange the, work, strange yeah, work. God, that's that's God's strange work. It is strange yeah. to his character, but he is still able to do it and he does it. Why? Because of the ultimate glory that comes from these evils. That's the whole point. That is the reason. But so the person it, wouldn't, sorry, but the person wouldn't know that. The person, there are people who said they hate God because yeah. God is, yeah. is, is allowing them to do these things or yes. causing these allow. things to happen to them. He doesn't allow. How do you he, encourage those people? He directs, he actively directs the, them to do these things. You see the point. That's why people don't have free will. Free will is out of the question. They have a will. They choose things. They choose wrong things. But they don't want to do it. But God is leading them to do them still, to do those, those things still. Yes, it's still God. But the point is, God has the long-term purpose in view. That's what they need to learn. Who is God really? Who is he really? He doesn't shy away from doing evil as part of his strange work. But they need to know that. And if they talk to God, I don't know if God will hear, uh, if God will heed their prayer. But if they pray to God, they talk to God and they say, okay, I understand that you are doing this or you are letting me do this. So thank you for what it's worth. Thank you. And, and it's a matter of finish. attitude. It's a matter of attitude. Like, as you said, it's about a how person. You see God. Exactly. How you, if... If uh, for someone mature in faith, for example, Paul, this story here, a literal messenger from Satan is sent by God to buffet Paul. Paul is not complaining. Paul is not saying, why is God doing this to me? Because Paul understands that everything that happens, as he said, he said, for the sufferings of this current era does not even deserve the glory about to be revealed in us. So for yeah. someone that doesn't have that perception, um, that, like they will see it that way. And we can't do anything about that, even in explaining yeah. it to them, because that is based on the faith given to them by God. For one yeah. who understands that, however, they know that, that whatever is happening, no, no matter how severe it is, it is leading towards their ultimate glory. And as a matter of fact, Paul says it that whatever we experience, no matter how bad it is, it doesn't even deserve. 
it, that means it cannot be compared to what is, 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 is in store for us. And there's even a story in Second Kings where God himself sends an evil spirit to deceive and make someone think something else. So again, all of these texts are there. They're right throughout the scriptures, both in the circumcision and, and, and the body of Christ's evangel. Yeah. It's all right through the scriptures, but again, one cannot understand these things unless it is revealed to them. Yeah. And hence, you can try to share it, but if they do not believe, as Paul says, a slave of the Lord must not be fighting. He must be up to teach, bearing, meaning you must be patient with people who are antagonizing with these things because if it is God's will, they will sober out of the trap of the adversary. But if it is not his will, then until that time where all come to a realization of God, that yeah. will be the experience that they have. Let, um, me, let me share something with you guys. Um, uh, this is just my view, but about the ratio, about the ratio between glory and evil, evil experiences that uh, the, what you just mentioned about the sufferings of this era do not even compare to the glory that will that awaits us uh that ratio how can you calculate <laughs> that ratio how can you calculate that um i see it like this if we look at what happened in the garden of eden with adam and eve they were not supposed to eat from that fruit of the tree of knowledge and evil. Uh, so, sorry, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, they ate. Let's say that fruit was good, delicious, tasted good. So let's now assign that level of good to a number, plus, a plus number, plus one, plus one. What is the consequence of their disobedience? The world at large is plunged into unbelievable darkness and sin and what have you, right? So what now could be, what value could be attached to that world in sin? All the sin of the world ever done and ever will done in the future. What value could we add there in a minus value, of course? Let's make it a let's make it a trillion as an example. A trillion. Yeah? Minus trillion. So plus one and the ratio is minus trillion. That is the consequence of the plus one. Right? Now we are going to turn the table. Jesus died for us. Can you attach a, val a value to his suffering and death? Attach a value. Just be spontaneous here. <laughs> mm. Attach a value. But uh, it needs to... Ten trillion. A, a, a trillion too? Ten trillion. Ten, Ten. trillion. Okay, yeah. so this, okay, so the suffering of Jesus is greater of one person, is greater than all of the suffering of the world ever done and ever will be done. Well, it would be less in that case. You, you could from say a human, it. from but, a human perspective, but, but yeah, from God's designs perspective, it's the greatest Jesus yeah. encompasses all, so that's yeah. another story. Yes, true. Yeah. That's but the, the point sense. is this so let's let's say, just for argument's sake, one billion uh, minus one billion. So, what do we have now? The plus one of the eating of that fruit leads to minus a trillion. Of evil and sin and misery. And then now the solution of God. Minus a billion. Will lead to what? Plus what? Hmm. Can't compare. It's a, it's a billion times a trillion. That is the one. Because that trillion. That minus trillion. And the plus billion. If you, if you multiply them. Then you have that value. And that is a, a quintillion in glory. So the glory, the ratio between our suffering and our glory is the same. 
between the ratio uh, between uh, Adam's eating and the, 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 the taste of that fruit and, uh, and uh, um, the suffering of Jesus. You see, you see that point? That's the ratio. Mm -hmm. So if you would quantify it, I mean, that would be the logical ratio of glory that would await us. And that's unbelievable. You cannot even fathom it. So, so every individual in the end of the, at the end of the day, every individual, we all experience um, evil, misery, etc. in life. But the glory that awaits us is unbelievable. That's the point. And you, uh, you mentioned it here already, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in Romans 8. They will be freed from the slavery of corruption. Exactly. But this. There is also another one that you, um, that you uh, mentioned in Romans 8, I think. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the Romans 8, verse 18, yes. Mm -hmm. And also 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, I think. Yeah. For the momentary lightness of our affliction, you see that Paul calls it lightness, and you know how much Paul has suffered for the evangel. And he says, for the momentary lightness of our affliction is producing for us. You see, it produces that evil. A, a transcendent, 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 transcendent Ionian burden of glory. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lie. You cannot fathom this. So, I hope it's clear. This is the reason for evil. Yes. And it's temporary. Yes. Andrea? Yes. Yes, yes one more. Um, I, the, 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 counts got, the scripture, God operated in the counts of Israel. Sometimes it kind of um, threw me off and I really don't get it. Quest, next question I want to ask. In order for God's glory, to be seen, all right. In all right, so for instance, my husband go up there and get about ten women pregnant. That would be God's will. I'm just being stubborn okay. and disgusting. Can so you how would it? God glory? How would God glory be seen? Is, is it that I would have to forgive when I would have to forgive him for God glory to be seen in Andrea or what? What? Uh, I didn't understand your question. I'll, re I'll re rephrase it. I'll rephrase it. She was asking if her husband, because she was she she, she oh, said that know. yeah, if her husband goes, so this is just a question. Yeah. If her husband goes and takes on ten women, is that still God's will for her glory or what? That's that's the question. It's God's. It's God's counsel. Yeah. It's so God's it's counsel. not God's will, of course. But it's God's counsel. It's God. It's God directing everything. Also, that according to His counsel, in order for you, but also for your husband, in that sense, to ultimately, in the long run, uh, have experienced the greatest possible glory. That is the whole thing that God is aiming at in the long run. So uh, you, I heard the word forgiveness. I would say for now, believers in this day and age are to show grace to others. Mm -hmm. Not forgiving. Forgiving, of course, but the grace is way better. Grace is like as if the other is innocent. Grace, because you also have received grace from God. Doesn't mean you, you won't talk to them or you won't uh, admonish them or you won't, uh, you know, uh, have, a, uh, have a good talk with them about that, of course. But it means that you're, you, you are not focused on them or what they are doing. You are focused on Christ. And if you are focused on Christ, then automatically you will hold on loosely to everything on earth including your marriage, including your possessions, including everything. You will hold on loosely to that because it's not important anymore. You have nothing to lose here on earth in that sense. Okay, okay. 
that would be the mindset especially of believers in this uh in this era yeah it, it just goes right back both you know miss Tad's question your question Andrea. it goes right back to how we see god because yeah. if you see god as the designer of everything nothing else really matters i exactly. do not i've experienced it myself the weight of certain situations seem light as paul yeah. calls it this momentarily light affliction exactly. and paul yeah. in, in reflecting on his life paul suffered more than any of the apostles by far he suffered more than any any of the apostles yeah. and it was also a consequence because he was persecuted the evangel of god god gave him his weighted suffering of yeah. that as well but even that suffering he calls it a light affliction because of the transcendently great burden of glory it, it shows how heavy it is he said it's a burden of glory it, it yeah. will be so overwhelming that's also the meaning of glory yeah it yeah. means burden it means heavy and so it, it's unbelievable what what awaits us and by the way the reason why paul says light affliction is because he already pondered it, it doesn't mean he understood it because we are mm. in a in a fleshly in a in a soulish body but he pondered the glory that awaited him he was thinking about how unfathomable that must be and then in compared to that everything that he experienced was it seemed light already even then so we can already in this bodies already think about the enormous glory that awaits us and by the way can you go to philippians 2 first was it no four sorry four first six and seven mm, right there yeah and it says here as two believers in, in this day and age do and first six do not worry about anything but in everything good and bad and evil by prayer and petition with thanksgiving again good and evil let your requests be known to god and what will happen then does it say and god will hear you and he will heed your prayer no and it says then the peace of god that is superior to every frame of mind shall be garrisoning your heart and your apprehensions in christ jesus that means that you will the moment you talk to god about these things you will immediately feel like okay indeed what am i worrying about man what am i worrying about what i mean man thank you god thank you thank you father for these things thank you for everything also for the evil in my life yeah I mean, it says you're garrisoning your hearts and apprehension your mindset of the situation becomes one yeah. of these yes and by the way where is your heart right here yeah <laughs> it's here it's not the organ it's here <laughs> this is where the battle the battle happens so to speak relatively speaking this is where the battle happens yeah. ponder ponder on these things always think about these things that is the point it will fill your mind and then it will fill your mindset it will become part of the way you're thinking and it comes back here if you are focused on bad things then that will crowd your mindset and that is why it says whatever is true whatever is grave whatever is pure whatever is agreeable whatever is renowned if yep. there is any virtue or applause, take yep. these things into account. Because as you yep. continue to focus, again, again, just going right back to mindset. If you are focused on the human aspect of your life, then there is reason to be miserable. If you are yep. focused on the one who leads everything to its grand design, then even within those situations, you become peaceful and for many i, I know for especially in, in christianity when most of us we could not understand why even those of the israelite faith they could endure persecution with patience even in the face of death they were yeah. 
they did not, you know, the three Hebrew boys, they did not, but they did not flinch one second because they understood that even if God did not save them, that was their declaration. Even yeah. if God did not save them, the end game of all of that is still something way mm. better than them burning alive. Yes. With, that it is was much better than their flesh melting off their skin. Yes. That end game was still far better than them being burnt alive in a fire. That is what faith is. You have exactly. the end game in view all the time. The end game all the time. You can read about the faith uh, of different believers in uh, Hebrews, Hebrews 13. 11, 11. Of and, 13 uh, or 11? Uh, 13. Oh, 13. Yeah, was, it, was it? No, sorry. 11. Is it uh, yeah, 11? It's 11. Yeah, 11. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, 11, 11 and 25. No, yeah. I, I have 13 in mind because uh, of the, the first 13 here. Mm -hmm. where, where, yeah. where it says in faith um die oh, I jumped to, yeah oh you die to 25 yeah uh, 25 yeah. is about moses where it says by faith moses becoming great disowns the term son of pharaoh's daughter so that's a elevated title he disowns it because he knows there's something bigger coming for him so preferring rather to be maltreated with the people of God than to have temporary enjoyment of sin, deeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked away to the reward, long-term reward. That is the point. You focus on your long-term glory. That way. <laughs> Un incomparable to everything you have here on earth, whether good or evil, it's nothing. But as humans, um, there, there are times when it just seemed really overbearing and it seemed like we can never understand why um, you know, situation constantly happens to us or situation constantly recur. Now, as humans, we are going to wonder, we are going to maybe cry, we are going to be distressed. But yep. as you say, we have to focus on the future, yep. on the benefits that comes, um, yep. you know, after all these things. Our expectation, yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. So let me um, circle back to one little thing from the, um, the essence of the evangel. We talked about justification, meaning uh, declared not guilty. But, and also we mentioned conciliation, but let me mention that justification, so is that, that one that is done thanks to Christ and the blood of Christ, of course. And conciliation is uh, the fact that God has, uh, or God is conciliating the world to himself through also through the death of his son. That is what Romans 5 verse 10 says. God is, con so the conciliating is a process and it will be finished at the consummation of God's plan. So at the end of the fifth eon. Why is it important? Because justification is to be declared uh, uh, not guilty. But then conciliation means that God says to you and now I take you as my son. You are my son now, from, from now on. That's mm -hmm. the point. That's conciliation. And if that's the case, then, then the, the tie that is being realized there is called reconciliation. So then it's a two-way street. So God has always been conciliated to his creation. Of course, because God has always been at peace, even in the next era the short era of god's indignation that will come very soon even then where where he whips he whips his his creation but he does it also in love and he is at peace with his creation even while whipping because it is necessary for their correction that is the reason why so he is always at peace and he now has uh, conciliated the world he is conciliating the world 
with himself through the death of his son. So, so take that with you also. So let me ask, um, based on what I had understood in the study with Joel, we, he did mention that we're going to go in the next eon where there will be holiness and righteousness being exuded. But you just said we are going to go into an era where his wrath is going to be um, realized. Okay. Eon and era are two different things, but you can yes. explain that. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. Yes. Uh, era is a general term. In this case, with era, I mean administration, in which something is dispensed. That there are, I, well, there are discussions about it, but I uh, distinct 12 administrations from Adam until the consummation. 12 administrations. And every administration, there is something dispensed or multiple things dispensed. That's another uh, thing. An administration is like a household. It, the Greek word is oikonomia, meaning economy, oikonomia, and that is household in which certain rules are valid and other rules are therefore not valid, but valid in other administrations. So I was talking about the current administration of, in which grace is being dispensed, a transcendent grace, and the next era, the next administration will be of God's indignation, in which indignation will be dispensed and outpoured on the earth. We will not be on the earth at that time. But then the next eon will start after that era, yeah. and that is the eon of uh, righteousness. Righteousness. In righteousness out of faith and works will be prevalent on the earth, the kingdom on the earth. That will be a thousand years. And that will also be another administration, same thing. So eon oh. and administration in that sense will be the same. Oh, let me mm -hmm. see if I get it. So you're saying then with this wicked um, eon that we live in, after this eon, we are going to go in a dispensation where God's, God's wrath will be expressed. That's what you're saying? No, it happens within this eon. Remember, yes. Revelation, yes. the period of Revelation is what ends this present eon. Okay. So the, 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 the administration of God's wrath upon the earth will be happening in this eon. Currently, also in this eon, right now, his grace is being administered. As right, says. right. But yeah. after that ends, then will unlawlessness run rampant on the earth and God's indignation will be present in that. I will. Oh, I will. Okay, in this same eon. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. I have made, in the past, I've made a series about uh, the body of Christ from sonship to, sorry, from childhood to sonship. But it, the first three, I think, three episodes, uh, I went through all the 12 administrations. So you can watch that if you want. You can look for it in the magnifying glass. You can key uh, in the word childhood, and then you will find everything with the with title uh, every title with the word childhood in it uh, for your information so from the second eon when from adam in the second eon to the consummation is four eons right the second okay. third fourth and fifth eon mm -hmm. but there are 12 administrations in that period and i think let me see quickly i think in the second eon there are two administrations there were two administrations active. And in this third eon, there are eight administrations. And uh, can, then you, in the, can, in you, the, can you indicate which of the administrations have already passed? I can think, let me see if I know them by heart. So the first, administra uh, the first administration in the time of Adam was uh, uh, innocence. In this eon, I'm talking. In this evil eon. Oh, in this eon, okay. Yes. Yeah. Then it starts. It starts with government. That's the first. Uh, At the end of the flood, the humans were were um, uh, let's say permitted by God to govern themselves. Okay. Human government. So that's mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. The second is promise, the promise of God to Abraham. Oh, okay. The third one is um, law law that god gave to mo uh, through moses to israel only to israel law was only for israel the next one is um uh 
truth and grace that was in the ministry of Jesus on earth, mm -hmm. or grace and truth. You can find that in John 1, verse, I think, 17, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then the next one is Pentecost. Mm -hmm. That's five, I think. And there, the next one is at, uh, transition. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the administration in which Israel was declining and the message of Paul was was uh, emerging, so to speak. Okay. That w that was when the body of Christ was uh, started and grew. Mm -hmm. And now we are in the administration of secret, in which transcendent grace, not just grace, but transcendent grace is poured, it dispensed, and that is the seventh one. And then oh, the okay. last one, the eighth one in this eon will be god's indignation okay all right yeah. so two eight one one okay in the second eon two administrations innocence and uh, and conscience so the conscience is then waken up woken up mm -hmm. and there are eight in the third eon there are and there is one in the fourth and one in the fifth eon okay the one in the fourth is when the righteousness of christ will be exuded all together well, yes, on the earth. Yes, on the earth, yes. yes. And in the heavens, that's another story altogether because then we will dispense God's rich grace to the celestials. Okay, yes, that part I, I, I remember. Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. Awesome. Uh, uh, yeah, any more questions on this segment? Because I know you want, we wanted to touch prophecy a little bit. Uh, any other questions based on whatever would have been discussed here? Any comment? Thank you for 25. I have a question. Yes. Um, how important is prayer? Seeing as you've been discussing that God operates in his will and his counsel. That's my question. We, we, uh, we, we cover that, uh, especially through Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. That's how important prayer is. Because prayer is not, uh, is not, has nothing to do with asking God for stuff. It's nothing. An yeah, it's an attitude. It's not talking to God also. So again, prayer is not talking to God. Oh. No. Explain prayer that for me, a, please. <laughs> prayer, it's mm -hmm. simple. Prayer is an attitude. It's a mindset. It's a mindset of constant awareness that God is right here, where you are. God is with you. The constant awareness is prayer. Why does Paul say in, I think, 1 Thessalonians 5, if I'm not mistaken, where he says, pray uh, unintermittently. Yeah. How can you pray under, inter, unintermittently if you're talking to God? Are you walking on the street talking? The King James says, pray without ceasing. How can you yes. continually be talking, talking. to God? It's, it's yes. a mindset. It's you're a walking on the street and you're talking to God. You're praying, talking to God. They, will, they, will, they, will, they will lock you up in an institution. <laughs> 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 so, so, of course not. It's a mindset. It's the way you think. That's why your mindset needs to be filled. It needs to be filled with the right ponderings. Pondering on God and his plan, on his greatness, on his, on his mercies, and of course on your expectation, what awaits you. That is important. And that is the mindset. That's prayer. That's prayer. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Yep. So we can All transition right. and, you know, the next topic that we'll cover before the final Q&A was around prophecy, how the current developments are leading into that. As, as you guys can see, we're getting towards, closer and closer towards the end of this age. And of course, there are many key things to take note of. So, you know, Peter, you can take the floor on that. So uh, you want me to talk about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, whew, my goodness, I don't know where to start. <laughs> There's so much going on. But anyway, uh, uh, first of all, it, we 
in the body of Christ um, as believers coming out uh, through the evangel of Paul uh, uh, I have heard sometimes that we are not living in prophetic times I do not agree with that statement we are living in prophetic times however the question is what kind of prophetic times that's the question if you're talking about Israel prophetic times I more or less agree that we are not living in times in which Israel pro pro uh, prophecies are being fulfilled we are not we are living in times in which Paul's prophecies are being fulfilled the uh, we already passed the time of the prophecy in first uh, Timothy 4 verse 1 and also now we are in the pro time of the prophecy of let, let's look at this one first first uh, Timothy 1 first uh, 4 verse 1 now the spirit is saying explicitly that in not in the end of the eras but in subsequent eras some will be withdrawing from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and the teaching of demons what is a good example of a teaching of demons the trinity and that was already in 325 after christ a.d at the council of nicaea so that is what he means by subsequent eras so quite soon after his demise his prophecies began to come into fulfillment fulfillment and now we are in that time also for a long time now in second timothy 4 first i think also one or or is it three if you go to second timothy 4 second second timothy okay. Let's see. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. In the era, for three. Yeah. Yes. For the era will be. Um, I'm not going to read everything, but oh, that's a whole list there. For the mm -hmm. era will be when they will not tolerate sound teaching anymore. That's this era for a long time already. Uh, but their hearing being tickled, they will heap up for themselves teachers according with their own desires. We are living in those times. Whoa, my goodness, we are living those times bigly. So, and it's a whole list of things, and the list of things to be uh, pointing towards religious people. Look at verse 5, I think. Um, is that the one? Let me see. I'm turning away. I think hearing from the truth yet will be turned aside to myths. No, no, no. Uh, let me see. Oh, no, I think it's chapter 3. Sorry. I think it's chapter 3, verse 5. That's what I meant. Sorry. So this yeah. one also, what, I just, what we just read. But chapter 3, for men will know this, know that in the last days, last days, so we are living in those days, perilous periods will be present. Or uh, the word is also ferocious periods will be present for men will be and then you have a, l a long list selfish fond of money etc etc and look at verse 5 having a form of devoutness yet denying its power a form so not the real devoutness but a fake one a form just of, not the contents but the form of devoutness and that, uh, that can only point towards religious people, people in church. This is people in church right here. So think about it. So we are living in those times. Oh, my goodness. Oh, definitely. And uh, I'm not going to expound on the, on the developments around us, but there is a lot happening behind the scenes. And we are quite close to a what I call a kind of a turnaround on the earth in which big things will happen so big that all of humanity will see it immediately they will notice it immediately things will happen in the air in the atmosphere uh, if you look up you will see things changes and uh, things will change in the air uh, I heard a lot of things I'm not going to mention them so uh, so that I still can upload this on YouTube <laughs> <laughs> very important so uh, uh, I will not mention those things, but there's a lot of things happening. And I have an, 
uh, an, what is the word, a suspicion, only a suspicion that the snatching away will happen around those developments of that turnaround. So when the turnaround happens, there will be truly, truly another, another era, I could say. And I, I would say the era, is the era of God. Yeah, it will start with false peace. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the era of God's indignation. And people, they seem to be blind for the fact that the false peace is also part of God's indignation. Of course it is. He because sends the operation of deception. It, yeah, that, fee, that, that, that peace is not genuine. It is false. That means it is part of a deception. Of course, it is part of God's indignation, but it is the start of it. So that's why I believe that that is also the same moment is that the first seal in Revelation 6 is opened. That will be the start of that false peace. And also it will be the start of what we call the day of the Lord. And that is the broad uh, definition. You have two definitions. Well, I have two definitions of the day of the Lord. The broad one, which will start at the opening of the first seal. And it will end at the burning up of heaven and earth at the end of the fourth eon. That will be the end of that day of the Lord in the broad sense. And the one in the narrow sense is the day of the Lord in which Jesus Christ will return. That is the narrow sense. So the broad sense will start at the opening of the first seal. And that will be the start of that false peace. And a day in scripture always starts with sunset. Very important. And it ends with sunset. Starts with sunset. And then it gets darker and darker and darker. And then it is night. And then at the end of the night, it is the darkest. Just before dawn, just before dawn, remember that word, just before dawn, and then the dawn comes. And then it be in, the, in, the, in the furthest, further, and at the horizon, you will see it, be, it gets lighter very slowly. And then it gets lighter and lighter be, before the sun appears. And then you see the sun appearing, right? Well, the sun appearing, you can, you can compare that to the return of Jesus Christ. That is the sun appearing. But the dawn is when the, when the beast is, is runs rampant on the earth. And the great affliction runs rampant on, the, uh, rampant on the earth. That is the dawn. That is when the night is the darkest and the dawn is just starting. That just starting. Why? Look at Isaiah 14, verse 12. Oh, just Man. before you read Isaiah 14, verse 12, um, what kind of affliction um, is that going to be since we all have already been accustomed to um, going through these evil situations and us ourselves will be involved in evil? What, how would you classify that affliction? Is it something separate? Or is Very much worse. As, the, as Christ yeah. says, it but, will be a time worse than any time since man yeah. has been on the earth. Ever on the earth, yes. But, yeah. but let me understand first. You say we. What do you mean by we? Oh, okay. So the, the body of Christ um, um, will, will be not here. be on the earth. Okay, yeah. okay. No, 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 no. no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. Now that's the point. Yeah. So, so let me uh, elaborate a little bit first before I say a 14, 12 comes. So the day of the Lord starts with, also in the broad sense, with, with sunset. But at sunset, is it already dark? No. It is twilight, right? So it's not dark yet. And then slowly, it's first twilight, and then it gets darker and darker and darker. You see? That is very important to see, to understand. So uh, now you, oh, you, 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 yes. I wanted well, to just use that to bring the point that yeah. the beginning of the sunset is when the detainer, we are yep. the presence of the body of Christ, is detaining the yep. beginning of that dark period. Yes. So when the detainer 
is coming out of the midst, yes, then lawlessness, the lawless one is revealed. Yes, but but wait, hold, hold your point, because now I will immediately expound on this one mm -hmm. uh, by again mentioning the term, the day of the Lord, which is a long period, and it will start at the opening of the first seal. We already mentioned that. But yeah. go now to first one in Second Thessalonians 2. Yes, now I'm going to read. Listen to this. The context is being set here in first one. Now we are asking you, brethren, for the sake of what? The presence of our Lord Jesus Christ for us. That's the presence for us. And our assembling to him. So the moment we are assembling, uh, assembled to Christ in the air, we are Christ's presence for us. He is present for us. His presence is then a fact for us. Right? Because we are together with Christ in the air. Okay. So then... Paul says this, uh, uh, that you be not quickly shaken from your mind, nor yet be alarmed uh, either through spirit or through word or through an epistle as through us, as that the day of the Lord is present. Stop here. You see that the Thessalonians were panicking. And that's why Paul wrote the second letter very quickly after the first one. Because they were panicking. Why were they panicking? Because they received a false letter, and they thought it was Paul's letter, of someone who said that the day of the Lord already started. But wait a minute. Why were they panicking? I would say, wait a minute, but if the day of the Lord is starting, so what? Yeah, okay, the day of the Lord is started. No. Why were they panicking? Because they thought they were left behind. That's the point. Mm -hmm. So they were they think they, they were thinking we are left behind. So they were panicking because the day of the Lord already starts. So it will start immediately after the snatching away. That's the whole point. So Paul is now um, uh, putting them at ease with this letter. So he says, no one should be deluding you in verse 3. Very important. By any method, listen to this, because now he mentions something that is critical. For should not the apostasy be coming first, and the man of lawlessness be unveiled, the son of destruction. Stop here. This means that something must be coming first. But what is that something? Is that an apostasy as we have learned? What is an apostasy as we have learned? That is like a gradual falling away from the faith. But is that the situation here? Then when is that critical point? When is that critical moment of apostasy? When is that? It cannot be determined. Because it's very gradual, that apostasy. It is not true. It's the Christian teachers that teach this nonsense that apostasy is like a gradual uh, 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 falling away. No, it is a specific thing. The translation is very important. The, the meaning of words, very important. Because the meaning is different than usage. I repeat, meaning is different uh, than usage. So here, the meaning of apostasy in any case is departure. Departure. Keep it. Departure. So, uh, can you quick? Well, no, I can. I can. I, I will mention it out of the top of my head. In Acts 21, 21, it's used this, it uses the same Greek word apostasia. Mm -hmm. And there it talks about departure from Moses. Departure from the law of Moses. Because the Jews were accusing Paul that he thought he was teaching departure from Moses. So my he, question here is quickly, if they are not a part of the body of Christ... What would wait, they wait, be? Wait. Who is they? Who is they? The Thessalonians? Well, I'm speaking, we are talking about what's going to come upon the earth, right? Wait, yes, but 
But now I'm talking about a group of believers in Thessalon at Thessalonica. Okay, okay. So I thought you were making an example of them to amount it to what's going to happen in no, this era. Yeah, but but what I'm trying to show you from scripture is that the departure that must be coming first, that departure is in this context of usage, this context of physical departure from the earth. Mm -hmm. Oh. So in Acts 21, 21, in that context, the departure is departure from Moses, from the law, what they were, they were accused, the Jews were accusing Paul of. In this context, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 through 3, that context is for the sake of the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembling to him. That is the context. So the okay. departure here in verse 3 is a physical departure from the earth. This is very important. This is key. This is the proof that there is a, what the Christians say, uh, uh, teach, a pre-trip rapture or a pre-tribulational snatching away. So the snatching away will happen uh, one second before the tribulation or the first seal opens. The tribulation starts. I can put it the other way around. The tribulation starts one second after the snatching away. The first seal will be opened one second, so to speak, after the snatching away. Immediately. Okay. The next era, the next administration of God's indignation will start. And it will oh. start with, with sunset, which is still twilight. And that is that false peace. Still twilight, not darkness yet. Twilight. And that will slowly go into darker and darker uh, mode, so to speak. I hope this is clear. This is the proof. This scripture is proof. Yes, I understand. Okay. So, um, and just for, um, I, you don't have to go to Isaiah 12, uh, 14, 12, because I can just mention it. There, Christians use that first, that it's the, uh, to, to say that this is, this is the devil. That was mm -hmm. Lucifer, and he, he became uh, the devil. Nonsense. Never because there it's, Yes, there is talking about the king of Babylon, and it's a prophecy from Isaiah, the king of Babylon. But who is the king of Babylon that has that has multiple layers? Can be Nebuchadnezzar at, at that time, mm -hmm. but but it is also a double layer in the end times. That's why he is called also there the son of the dawn, son of the dawn. Ah, mm. remember what I said, the dawn. That is when the darkness is at its darkest and just before it, it be becomes lighter and lighter again. That's the dawn. That is the Antichrist. That is the beast in the end times. When, he, when the great affliction or the great tribulation is going on, when they are afflicting the believers out of Israel, it has nothing to do with the body of Christ, but with the bride of the Lambkin. They will go through the tribulation, not the body of Christ. The believers out of Israel, the bride of the Lambkin, they will go through the tribulation. So uh, they will be uh, afflicted very much, of course. They will pay with their lives. And also there will be some non-Jews also. They will be also come to the faith. They are called proselytes, but they are all believers uh, that are called the bride of the Lambkin. So they will go through the uh, tribulation and they will be afflicted, especially at the last uh, part of the seven years. So I hope this is clear. That's why it's also called in Isaiah 14, 12, he's called son of the dawn because it's also a prophecy that secretly a layer, a, a hidden layer is also referring to the end times when he also will be in Babylon, the beast, he will, he will migrate to Babylon and that will be destroyed at the last. That Babylon will be saved for last, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's why he is called Son of the Dawn, just before 
uh, it gets lighter. So I hope this is now clearer. Yes. So prophecy-wise, uh, there are countless prophecies uh, for Israel. So within the framework of Israel's uh, evangel. So I think we, if it if it is about the end times, there are so many prophecies, but we now know that uh, the prophecy that Israel will be alive again as a people is not being fulfilled yet. It has not been fulfilled yet. So also not in 1948, because this Israel is not the real Israel. They are still dead, so to speak. Mm -hmm. They are not brought to life yet. That will happen at the end when Jesus comes back. Then he will liberate his people. Then he will get into judgment with them. And then there will be a mass repentance of the whole people. As a people, they will repent. That is the moment where God will uh, open their heart, will uh, put his law in their heart, and they will be able to do the law effortlessly, supernaturally, of course. So that's when the, so that will all be done under the guidance of Jesus when he comes back. So uh, the times in which we are living now are not the end times scripturally speaking yet. No, but it is it is it is the end times of this administration for sure. Mm -hmm. The very end times we are. So uh, uh, I have the suspicion that it is we are very close to that turnaround i was talking about very close mm -hmm. yeah wonderful uh anything else you'd want to to cover me or no. uh, mm -hmm. for now uh, we have covered the the basics very yeah. important, of course we have gone through some uh, uh let's say what people could could um, view as anomalies how do you do this or how do you go through that? It's very important mm -hmm. to also address that. And of course, we briefly uh, have covered some end times prophecy because this uh, passage in Second Thessalonians 2 is very important. Mm -hmm. And it's especially important for the body of Christ to really understand this part. Again, Christianity does not understand it. this. They keep on they keep on saying that apost uh, apostasia that Greek word is apostasy. It's a it's like a process falling away. That is the sorry, but I'm going to say that word. That is stupid. Mm -hmm. You cannot say that. Sorry, it's foolishness. Because how can you pinpoint a certain event in that process? What event are you talking about? No, mm -hmm. Paul clearly says should not the apostasy be coming first that is a very key moment a very key event that's the point and it is departure that is the point departure beautiful beautiful uh so yeah we covered a lot we spoke about a lot uh guys do oh, you yeah. have any more <laughs> questions any more comments before we wrap this up for today Remarks. All right, so the departure here is means that um, Physical. Not, not from the body of Christ, but those who belong to the other group. Is that what no. you're saying? From no. the body of Christ? Yes, Paul is admonishing here. The Thessalonians are the body of Christ. Oh, okay. The Thess Thessalonians is one of Paul's 13 letters. And Paul is addressing, he is the apostle of the nations. So the body of, he is the first member of the body of Christ. Paul is. Okay, so you're saying so, that there yeah, per yeah. are persons who, who there will be a group of people that will fall away from the body of Christ. And... No, no, okay. no, okay. no, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> this is important. Okay, I'm glad you asked the question. Right. So, again, in Greek and Hebrew, a word has only one specific basic meaning. Only one. This is so important to understand. This is why God chose Hebrew and Greek to write his word in. That's why. Because they are clean, pure languages. So 
very important to remember, right? So that one word, that one basic meaning of that Greek word apostasia is departure. In any case, departure. That is what it means, departure. So then you need to look at the context next to see how you use it the right way. Okay. And if you read Acts 21, 21, in which the Jews were accusing Paul of teaching departure from Moses, then you can also say apostasy. Yes, you can say that. Apostasy because it's departure from the law, right? right. Departure. That's what they were accusing Paul of. So you can say apostasy. You can use apostasy there. Mm -hmm. It's a, it could be a process, yes. But in this context, the context is our assembling to him, first, uh, first one. Oh, okay, our, yes. Our assembling to Jesus in the air, that's the context. Yes, yes. So in this context, departure means physical departure, snatching, snatching away. No way. Oh, okay, we yes. Are, so first the snatching away must happen, and then the man of lawlessness will be unveiled. Verse 3, look at verse 3. No one should be deluding you by any method, for should not the snatching away be coming first, and the man of lawlessness be unveiled, the son of destruction. That's what it says, okay. effectively. Yes, I get it now. <laughs> okay, ah, I'm glad. Very important. <laughs> yes. Very important. Okay. All right. Other question or remarks? Ah, well, if, if that's the case, I think, I think this was a very good discussion. I think so, too. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 So if, if no other uh, discussion, then, yeah, I think we can, I can probably wrap up the recording now then. Yes, let's All do right, that. Let me just, let me just end it up.